Hi folks, I apologize for the break in the typical format here, but the details of this awesome conference I'm involved with just became available, and I wanted to share this information with you as soon as possible. On October 25th, Tate Behavioral will be hosting their first annual ABA conference in Springfield, Massachusetts. The event is titled, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, Seeing Further in Applied Behavior Analysis. This event will feature presentations by Megan Miller, Ryan O'Donnell, yours truly, and Kim Behrens. And if you haven't seen Kim present, you owe yourself to check this event out for that reason alone. As an aside, she had the dreaded post-lunch speaking slot at last year's New Hampshire ABBA, and she blew the doors off the place. She's just a fantastic speaker. Anyway, we'll close the day with a live recording of the Behavioral Observations podcast where I'll interview Dr. Kim herself. This event will provide six Type 2 CE credits, including one and a half ethics CEs, and lunch is included. So for more information on this event, including a discount code for podcast listeners, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash Tate 2019. That's T-A-T-E 2019. All right. I hope to see you there. Hey everyone, if you're looking for a deep dive into supervisory behaviors that really drive trainee performance, boy, is this the show for you. Welcome to Session 90 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. And in this episode, I chat with Dr. Zara Hajiagamoseni, and she talks about her really cool dissertation research that she just wrapped up a few months ago. And again, it's a deep dive in all things supervision. So I don't want to spoil it by describing it too much here in the introduction. You'll just have to wait for the interview. And it's really, really good stuff. I think uh, anyone who's in a position of uh, supervision will get a lot out of it. So uh, before we get to that interview, I do want to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Behavior University. Yes, Behavior University is bringing university level and university quality instruction to your continuing education needs. Head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations and you'll see that they have a special deal set up just for behavioral observations listeners. And today's episode is also brought to you by HRI Recruiters. Yes, Barb Voss, while she may be based out of Colorado, she can find you a job just about anywhere. Uh, and she can help you with your resume. She can help you find out what the appropriate salary ranges are for the area that you're looking at. And even more, she can even help agencies find their dream candidate. So to learn more about that, head on over to hricolorado.com forward slash contact. So I think that's it for introductory comments. So without any further delay, please Enjoy this fun conversation with Zara. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Zara Haji Aga Moseni. Thank you so okay. much for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> it's both East, East Coast for us, which is nice. <laughs> yes, yes. We're not up late or up super early. I interviewed someone the other day at about 8 a.m. Eastern time, and they were on the West Coast, and I felt really badly for them. And I've yes. done it on the other way around as well, so I'm glad we're both kind of in the same time zone. So, um, again, welcome. Thanks for taking time out of your morning to chat with me. We're going to do like a really deep dive into supervision and particularly some of the awesome work that you've done in your yeah. dissertation defense and i am excited to hear more about it uh before we get to that however let's talk a little bit about how you got into the field so uh, why don't you kind of take it away then yeah yeah um i i had like sort of a 
a story that I has resonated with um, with me with some of your other guests where people inadvertently work with a child who has autism Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of so for me I was 20 years old had just moved to Long Island New York. And I was a water swimming instructor. And I had volunteered for a special needs class, water class on a Saturday and really not knowing. It was very naive. I just wanted to help kids swim. And I got assigned to work with three kids who had um, autism, three brothers. And unbeknownst to me at the time, I was working with the child who had the most severe, um, I guess, sensory issues in the water, like the sound, the the actual feel of the water. But I got him into the water and to do a backflip, which was a huge thing. And I remember taking him out of the water and the parents were on the verge of tears. And I didn't understand. And the mother came up to me and she goes, she goes, I can't believe he works so well with you. And she then offered me a job. She goes, would you be willing to work with my children after school? Um, and I said, sure. And then this is how naive I was. My next question was, what's wrong with them? (laughs) It sounds horrible. And she goes, they have autism. And then, well, what's autism? Okay. So (laughs) that was kind of the the birth of, of kind of where it started. And she was uh, such a great, both of them are great parents, Janet and Bert. They're, they're so near and dear to me. I actually dedicated my dissertation to them um, because they impacted my life so significantly. Um, but from there, Janet was really, um, motivated to make sure I understood how to work with her children. And so she took me to these parent training classes at the Cody center at Stony Brook. So that's a SUNY school for those um, who aren't, aren't familiar. And that's where Ted Carr was the FCT functional communication training guy. And unfortunately we lost him, um, years ago, but, um, I had no idea at the time where I was relative to, um, understanding applied behavior analysis and how, what a cool opportunity that was. But I remember leaving that first parent training series with her. And I was like, this reinforcement stuff is pretty cool. And I was hooked. I literally left that class and was like, I want to, I want to do this. So that's kind of the beginning, the birth of it for me, where I was just so inspired and it all made sense. I was like, there's this really logical science about human behavior and it makes sense to me. So that was kind of the birth of it for me. I see. And and so you're 20. Were you in college at that time or had you uh, uh, not, not started school yet? Or where, where were you in kind of like your just general educational timeline? Yeah, so I had, um, believe it or not, I had finished my um, bachelor's degree already um, through the University of Maryland, and my bachelor's was in psychology, my undergrad. I had a BS in psychology. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I was kind of in a weird phase where I was, um, I took a class at Stony Brook. I was trying to figure out, you know, and anyone who else who has a BS in psychology knows that you really have to know where you're going with that because you're not going to go get like a wonderful job for like 60000 or $50,000 a year. You- yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> okay, what bookstore am I going to manage? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I was a water swimming instructor, Matt. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with my bachelor's degree. So yeah, that, for, for me, for me it would be like the... Uh, <laughs> my, my my college I was a, I had an undergrad in psychology and I think if it weren't for going to grad school I would be like the uh, uh, I think my job at the time was the working at the Timberland Factory outlet in Kittery Maine uh, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we all have our, our, our backup plans, I guess, right? Yes, yes. Mine's mine's uh, being to be a barista in Asheville, North Carolina, FYI. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so I wasn't quite there yet, though, because I was still trying to figure that out. So I was in a weird phase, and and that's why, and that's one of the reasons why I dedicated my dissertation to them. And I really mean this. Like they meeting them was it was like it meant to be because it gave my life like meaning and direction, if that makes sense. I I finally, it was like a light bulb. It's like, you know, when you know, like that was it for me. It was that moment where I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life. So so let me ask you this. So uh, again, having a a bachelor's in psych myself, uh, you know, I was fortunate (laughs) enough to to have some treatment of behavior analysis in, in my curriculum. Did you have any preconceived notions about behaviorism or behavior analysis or any background in it uh, from your, from your bachelor's? Yeah, so I vaguely had, yeah, like maybe one course, yes. And and honestly, and I don't know what you were doing in your undergrad, but I don't know that I was 
fully paying attention 100% of the time. <laughs> so, and I don't even know what I got in that course, honestly, but it's it's kind of like all a wash, right? Where you're just kind of like, I did it. I got the bachelor's degree, but really, what did you take away from from it? What, you know, so I, I really didn't have any preconceived notions, like at okay. that point where I was just sort of, if you will, a blank slate. Got it. Got um, it. Um, so, yeah. so you, the light bulb goes off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and so I'm, I'm assuming at some point or another you got to decide. Okay, I've got to go to school to yeah. do, do more. You know, to get more access to this. Yeah, to get more training. Exactly. So one of the things that I did in the interim was uh, through working with them, I was able to also get a job. And it's so funny how we use these titles, which is why like, I'm trying to desperately get licensure in South Carolina. Um, the, the title of be- assistant behavior specialist. And that was, um, I, I worked at a job at, it's now called just ARC. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it previously meant the Association of Retarded and Handicapped Children. They no, yep. no longer use that. Um, so I worked at Southampton in Long Island as a, an assistant behavior specialist. And I don't even know what qualified me other than having the bachelor's degree. That's kind of scary if you think about, because I was like looking at behavior plans and, and but it was, it was kind of just like, you just had the bachelor's degree and that's all that was needed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you've seen that in other places or we still have some of these issues with. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Degrees. Totally. Yeah. It yeah, kind of so reminds I, me of, uh, uh, I don't know if you watch The Office at all, but... Uh, uh, I'm an office fanatic. Okay, so you, you know you Dwight Schrute's title, like he's the assistant to the assistant regional manager or something yes. like that, you know? Yes, yes, I am. I watched every single episode all the time. So yeah. yes, we can talk about Dwight if you want. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. Just just exactly like that. Um, so uh, that was kind of an interesting experience. And through there, through that experience, I, I got introduced to a psychologist, Dr. Nick Rose, who was like, oh, by the way, he goes, you seem really interested in this behavior stuff. I was like, well, that's my job title. <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah. And so then he mentions, by the way, there's, I think there's this, uh, the board, this board that just came out. This was 2000, by the way. So mm. the board, had just been developed in, in 1998. And so, because I think they just started their own board, their own certification board. And I said, oh, okay. And I, again, was just 20. So that was kind of in the back of my head because I was trying to conceptualize how do I get from A to Z? How do I figure out what does this mean? Do I want to be an ABA person? Am I an autism person? What am I? Trying to figure that out. It was very unclear to me at that time, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so a little thing happened though, in the interim, as I was working, I was prepping to go back to grad school and had intended to, um, p- pursue something at a SUNY school. And then I kind of had a moment where I realized how much I missed my family. I'm the oldest of four and my youngest being 10 years, um, my, my, um, like 10 years younger than me, I missed my family so much. So I decided to move back to Charleston, South Carolina in 2003, um, just to be closer to my family, as silly as that sounds, uh, I just missed them so much. So I kind of moved back here in the interim. And I, so I started courses at, uh, Capella university in the interim so that I could get get the process started. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and while I was kind of along this transitional, I call it the transition of my early twenties where we've all gone through trying to figure out what am I doing with myself? Um, I worked a couple of jobs in our state department, the department of mental health. I worked as, um, like a, like a bachelor's level mental health practitioner. And then I was fortunate enough to get a transfer, a lateral transfer over, um, to the department of disabilities and special needs as an autism consultant. And again, I don't know what qualifies someone <laughs> as an autism consultant, but I got, I got the job, um, because I had the experience on my resume from working with the family in New York. So that was really helpful. And it's kind of, I, I knew a couple people, so I got that interview. And then in the interview I nailed, I nailed it. So they were like, yes, we'll give, we'll give you the job. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and so in that time frame, I figured, um, I finished out w- my coursework at Capella and was able to get a, a master's in psychology through their program. And at that point, I realized, okay, I have this. And then I had gotten more information on what is the BACB. 
So, and I know that sounds silly to say that now because everybody knows what it is, but at that point, I was still trying to put out everything together to figure out how am I going to make my career? How am I going to get all well, these qualifications? Well, you know, that that's totally relevant at that stage of the field's development, you know. So, I, and I think it's helpful to kind of remind listeners, and, the, the, you know, longtime listeners are probably sick of me saying it, but the field was so yeah. different. Yes. You know, 15, 20 years ago, and we, we're in this kind of embarrassment of riches now where there are plenty of <laughs> programs, plenty of training opportunities, all this technology that's bringing to bear on, on what we do. And uh, it just doesn't, it just was not the case. Uh, right. It was kind of like the dark ages back, you know, Plus. back in the day. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, uh, I think it's interesting <laughs> to point those things out periodically. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, Go ahead. I'm so, sorry. So we didn't have a program. So I had the master's finished, but then you still have to have um, the, the courses in addition and then obviously your field work. So while I was at the autism consultant, I was lucky enough to make some connections with um, – colleagues who had some experience at Uni University of South Carolina. So that's our state school in Columbia, which is our capital. And I got a meeting with someone. Again, I didn't know who this was at the time. I was just a naive, like 23, 24-year-old, <laughs> which is sometimes nice to be naive and not have any preconceived notions because sure. you're just walking in fresh. And so I got an appointment with Dr. Eric Drasgo at University of South Carolina, and he was... Um, He's in charge of their special education um, program. He's just he's just this amazing person. And I walked in and talk about you were talking about your own social skills, how you're more introverted. So when I walked into his office uh, at the campus on his front door was a task analysis for how to greet someone. Stand up, put your hand out, <laughs> offer a say hello. And it's just really fun. it's comical now because obviously he's a behavior analyst and he works with individuals with severe disabilities. But I was like, oh, my God, this is pretty cool. And he, in fact, did follow his task analysis and he he stood up and it was right from that moment of meeting him he was so kind and I, I went to see him because I needed someone to do my field work because I realized I had the workplace setting through the autism division but I desperately needed field work and there was like you said you talk about the dark ages nobody was doing supervision um, there was we had no in-state programs to pursue the, the, the course sequences that we needed um, so he agreed to do my field work at no charge which was a huge deal for me then because I think I was making $699 every two weeks. Right. And so I was just so poor. I was donating plasma. I was like working downtown on King Street um, at retail shops. It was just so such a huge deal for him to be so kind and generous. And so he did my field work and um, I was able to enroll in the SIU Southern Illinois University with Dr. Dixon, who I know you've had on repeatedly. And he's just a fantastic person. And Ruth Ann Rayfeld, they were my instructors at SIU for the course sequence. And I don't know um, where you where you did your courses. Um, I don't know which program you did, but you're right. It was hard finding a program. Like you said, they weren't all over the place online or easily available. So now we have one in state. Now we have a couple in state, but before this wasn't an option to do an in-state option. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. Right. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I. I, uh, I mean, my coursework was accidental uh, as part of the. Uh, I, I was. I started the PhD in experimental psych program at Auburn University, and ended up having to uh, unfortunately get out of that program uh, before before wrapping that up. So I left with my master's degree, but um, this is before the the verified course sequences. So my 
uh, office right. mate who was all the, at the place where I worked, uh, who also went to Auburn with me, Dr. Cheryl Ecott. Uh, she uh, she kept all her transcripts and syllabi and things like that. And back in the day, you actually had to submit all both your transcripts right. and your syllabi of the courses because uh, the verified course sequence was wasn't as wasn't that didn't exist or wasn't wasn't as well defined. And uh, so. I had to like basically go through like transcripts of like a behavioral safety course and other types of courses <laughs> that didn't necessarily uh, they weren't crafted with the idea of preparing someone for the certification exam. So anyway, yes. I, uh, I, I, uh, uh, so, um, but let's, let's, uh, let's turn this back to you. Uh, Cause I could go on. Oh, no, no, no. So it's, funny, it's funny. Cause, because you're right. I don't know if people are like realize how like, we're, we're so people who are coming out now, you're, we're so lucky. You're so lucky because there are so many resources available, including your podcast. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, imagine if this was around when we were going through oh, our stuff, goodness. how cool yeah. would that have been? Yeah. What's a podcast? What's an iPhone? Um, that'd be awesome. So, yeah. so uh, yeah. So let's let, let's dig into some. You know how you how you decide that you want to uh, what you want to pursue from for your doctoral training. I, I think you had yeah. kind of an inadvertent uh, change in, in direction. So, uh, bring yeah. us up to speed on on how you decided to tackle the, the problem that you did in your grad in your doctoral work. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I, I originally um, had started, I think I wrote this too, I originally had started doing um, in 2000, uh, I guess, 13-ish, I had started doing a line of research from it to fulfill my dissertation on behaviorals, how to use behavioral skills training, performance feedback to get um, non-certified individuals to use naturalistic techniques. And in the interim, I had like a, uh, not not a great car, a, a bad car accident. I had a, a, some brain stuff happen. So I was kind of on, in time out, if you will, for about two years. And during that time, the RBT credential came out. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, I was like, I wanted to do something that was meaningful and added um, to, although that is still meaningful, I wanted to do something that uh, on a bigger picture issue. And so a couple things happened. Um, one, I um, so I took two years in time out, and and I was able to get like medical leave or just get a leave of absence, if you will, because you have typically ten years to get a PhD done or to complete all of the requirements. For anyone who wants to know that, <laughs> you do have ten years typically, and some programs will take longer than others. So I was getting kind of close to the point where I felt better, and I wanted to take a second stab. And Dr. Drasgo was uh, my mentor, and. Um, dissertation chair was very encouraging. So I met with him in 2017. I said, okay, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling healthy. And I, I want to take another stab at this. This is important to me to finish up. It's a professional goal. And he had invested so much time in me. So um, we started having conversations. Um, and then and then um, another piece was I had recently just been voted in as our state chapter president um, of SCABA. So there were some things that were starting to filter in, if you will, on, on kind of my in my um, field of vision, if you will, it, from that role where I'm getting phone calls for people like I can't get field work placement, like people who are finishing their their sequences, but they can't get placed for field work. So people asking for resources and help. So that was kind of on my radar as well. But I'll tell you, there was one singular event, and I and I think I already shared this with you in my. Um, notes that was like eye-opening for me. I was at the 2017 ABAI Paris conference. And um, I know like people, not everyone is, people are dipping in and out because everyone wants to see Paris. But I knew I wanted, to, I love Linda LeBlanc. And um, I do have a girl crush on Linda LeBlanc. I love, I just love Linda LeBlanc so much. I love everything about her. You feel so good after you hear her speak. Yeah. Um, she just has that a way about her. I don't. It's not behavioral, but I don't. I always feel great, like I can conquer the world after I hear her speak. So I heard her and Tyra Sellers talk about supervision practices in the field. And oh my gosh, uh, I quite literally in my head was thinking, you are not doing good enough as a supervisor of fieldwork candidates. I left thinking you get a C minus <laughs> as a fieldwork supervisor. Like my internal private thoughts were like running up to the hotel room, starting to order every book I could find, every curriculum available. Because I was like, I'm not doing, this is for Megan Miller, hashtag I've got to do better. <laughs> That's 
that's for Megan. Megan, hashtag do better for supervision. Yeah, and I forgot to I forgot to credit <laughs> Megan yet again for uh, yeah. for for connecting us to the the unofficial yeah. executive producer of the Payroll Observations <laughs> podcast. She really, she's great. She's such a good networker. She's such a great person. But yeah, so I literally had that Megan Miller moment, and I remember panicking, freaking out, and like going through all these sorts of like thoughts of should I continue supervising? I'm I like question my ethics, my professionalism. I literally freaked out at that after I heard them speak but it was a good freak out because then I was like you know you have to calm down for a second and then say okay well hold on a second there we're we're still growing we're not in a steady state with supervision nobody's really got this right it's like the wild wild west I always kind of joke about that I you really don't know I mean we have our PECC professional ethical compliance code however um, there are some things that are really clear some things aren't and we're not really sure so I, I didn't feel necessarily horrible, but I did freak out a little bit. Um, but that was the singular event I would credit this idea to was that that kind of started forming the nugget. And then I was fortunate enough to get to speak with um, one of our faculty members at University of South Carolina, Dr. Katie Wolf, who was very gracious with her time and met with me for lunch. And she's in charge of our approved course sequence. And I kind of was just talking to her about how does she supervise? How does she handle her practicum? I was like asking her, how do you know how to structure it? How do you know what type of experience Etc. to provide your um, students. And sh- that was an, an interesting dialogue we had. And then one other person, um, and you may be interested in this person too for yourself because of the interpersonal skill component we had talked about, Dr. Laura Turner at University of St. Jo- Joseph in Connecticut. Are you familiar with her no. at all? Okay, she's really neat. Um, she's doing research on some of the things that you, I think, are interested in, like soft skills and personal skills, where she's looking at um, the the smaller details in the relationship, like the nonverbal behaviors, like the interactions between the supervisor and supervisee. Anyway, she's doing cool stuff. So she was kind enough to spend some time on the phone with me, and I just was like asking her what would be a contribution to the field. So I got the benefit of talking to a couple of people who helped me take an idea and start forming it into conceptualizing what would help our field. And so that was kind of me going in and saying, okay, I'm dropping the BST performance feedback like, because I had at that point gotten through all three chapters by my, up to my methodology and was ready to go potentially defend. Um, but I was like, I need to start over from scratch. And anyone who's been in dissertation program has <laughs> had that experience. Uh, yeah, that, there's probably people in the <laughs> audience who are breaking out in sweats at the thought of yeah. that. Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> It, but you know what, though? You should do what you're passionate about uh, because it, those late nights and moments where you're crying and want to, like, throw all your questions out and ridge off in the program, make it worth it. So, But some people do. Sometimes it is um, – it's not uncommon to have to start over is what I want to say with a new idea if, if something else happens. So I started over with this idea of let's look at supervision of fieldwork candidates and – um, that's kind of how it evolved and led into my dissertation study where I had this conceptualized idea and clear kind of topic that I was going in to look at. All right. So let's let's dig into it. So what, what did you decide to, to, to focus on? Yeah. So, all right. So this, this is probably not going to be a surprise to members of your audience, but um, I really, we don't really have a lot of information on supervision. So first and foremost, I, one of the things that immediately popped up and after talking to um a couple of the folks I got to consult with was we don't even really know what people are doing like as a baseline, like a comprehensive baseline. So I know you mentioned you were going to chart your workout, your your workout routine this weekend as your, your reinforcer. Yeah. (laughs) Which is hilarious. Um, I would probably do something like that too, but I would use an app. (laughs) Um, So I kind of like the idea of like, let's step on the scale and let's get some data because how do I know if what I'm doing is, if you will, um, good or bad unless I've weighed myself first, right? How do I know if I'm within a range of good or acceptable performance if no one's ever really took the time to put me on the scale? So initially I wanted to do a comprehensive assessment of what individual super behaviors um, uh, people were doing. Um, And so I essentially had to do a comprehensive literature review, which again, surprise, surprise, there's not a lot of information available um, geared specifically towards behavior analyst. Um, So, and I I saw in your 
shout out to your book and your book with Lisa, you guys had a lot of the same references I used as well um, from the 2016 um, special edition behavior analysis and practice where they focused on the supervision edition. So that was um, something that was helpful. And for any of your readers who haven't read that special edition, I want to encourage you to read that 2016. It's got a lot of great information in it. Um, yeah, and, you and know, I'll link that yeah. in today's episode too. Uh, that's a really good place to start and, and kind of get a, an idea of what's going on. So I kind of um, took took all of the information I could and cataloged 46 individual supervisor behaviors that are either um, recommended by recommended by, we'll call them leaders in the field, to so people who are already trying to publish on it or that are clearly supporting compliance with the uh, professional ethical compliance code. And this is like a quiz for your, anyone listening. I know you know the answer to this, but I'll pause. What part of the code, what number of the code in our PEC is designated for supervisors? Okay. So yeah. your answer should be. <laughs> Fill in the, <laughs> I happen to have it pulled up here. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Behavior analyst was a supervisor. And then for the rest, for those of you who are supervising, how many subsections are there of the code? And the answer should be seven. So there's seven subsections. And if anyone's like, I didn't know that, don't don't feel bad. I've only I spent the last year and a half of my life researching this and defending it, so I have to know this. And Matt's just written a book about it, so he <laughs> he has to know it fluently as well. But it's it's I was looking at behaviors that supported compliance or were clearly supporting compliance with our code. Um, and things that are also recommended as part of encouraging highly effective or quality supervision. So that's kind of what, what the idea was. I was like trying to figure out um, what what does it mean to be an effective supervisor, right? So if I say like, Matt, you're a good supervisor, what does that actually mean? If, and we're behavior analysts. We're the best people to do this research, um, to, to tease that apart. Um, and I remember last year you had Jim Carr on in April 2018. And he was updating people on like what the board was doing. And one of the things he talked about was uh, the, one of the number one alleged ethical complaints was uh, from supervisees uh, f- towards their, f- I guess, supervisors, field work supervisors. Yeah, yeah. So. like lack of documentation and, or, you know, other types of, you know, n- not providing a, enough time or what have you. And- yeah. And then if did you get to see the white paper on that that came out that they have linked on the board? I don't. I, don't know I looked at it a one. long time ago, so you're going to have yeah. to refresh my memory on yeah. it. So I didn't get to see it. I didn't have the advantage of reading it um, before because, you know, when you're doing your dissertation, you just have to keep moving because new stuff is always getting published. So I, I luckily got your podcast in right at the tail end, and I used that. I actually cited that um, in my lit review. So thank you for getting that because <laughs> April April was my was my stopping point, and then I was moving on to methodology. But that, thank you for that. But the white paper was now. So I pulled the white paper after I'd already done my proposal, and really what I saw was it was largely 5.0 three, which is supervisory delegation. And where I saw the most, um, I think, alleged complaints for that part of that code, the way that was described, it, I read it as 5.03. And Dr. Carr is obviously welcome to clarify that if I'm wrong, but I read it as it was the delegation of tasks, which would fall under 5.03. So there's a couple of pieces that I saw that um, and, and kind of formulating my, my questions and trying to figure out what was going on um, that kind of helped guide the, the whole process. Because I, I personally, um, I've, I've shied away recently in picking up fieldwork supervisees because, and I'll just say this on the air, and I don't know if other people think this, because of risk and liability. Um, because at points, when you're picking up a supervisee that you don't know, it's like you're getting it married almost because that person is linked to you and you're responsible for their behavior to an extent to to a certain extent you're responsible for their behavior ensuring that you have done certain things to to um put these protections in place to make sure they're behaving appropriately and their poor behavior will ultimately make people will come asking you for follow-up questions if something has happened like why wasn't this done and then also anecdotally i have colleagues in the field who were reporting i don't I don't want to pick up fieldwork supervisees because I'm afraid what if something happens. Sure. So there's this idea. Have you have you kind of had that experience or have you – I don't know what – have yeah. you had anything like that? You know, I, I think, you know, uh, not not to overly plug the book, but that's something we do talk yeah. about a little bit. Um, and it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a comprehensive discussion of the, of the topic, but the general idea is that 
you know, you need to know what type of work environment your trainee is going to be performing in and mm-hmm. uh, determine whether or not that's a, that's a, that's a setting in which you can you can actually be helpful in. Right. I'm kind of paraphrasing yeah. what we uh, put in the book, um, right? And, and there has to be some sort of overlap in, in those skills, so you can you, you can adequately serve them. Um, right. And, and I think what's implicit in that is kind of what you just said is you know is is that you know you have to kind of uh, you know and I, I think my mind goes to things like feeding and uh, let's see what else um, de- dealing with. Uh, you know, dangerous, high, you know, um, severity problem behaviors and things along those lines. And those are, those are activities that, uh, you know, people can really get hurt with if they're not supervised right. properly. And so I think those might right. be two areas. And, and I don't mean to minimize the importance of everything else that we do, of course, but right. th- those are certainly situations that could potentially pose uh, a, a, an unsafe situation. Uh, right. If not supervised properly, so yeah, b- people do need to be mindful about what their potential trainees are are contending with in their day to day clinical expectations and the extent to which they can adequately help them and, and uh, supervise that process. Yeah, exactly. And you bring up two really good points. And I was even thinking of other things like professionalism markers, people engaging, just uh, other parts of the, our code and expectations. But you bring up very uh, significant points in that. And and I think that's why 5.03 supervisor delegation in the white paper, that's kind of lends itself to what you're saying. That's in, critical. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to develop something, Matt, that would be um, – a contribution to practitioners, people like you, people like me, people that are supervising the next generation. And I want it to be something that was super clear so that you can walk away with when she says I'm a highly effective supervisor or that I can engage in behaviors that support effective supervision, this is what it looks like. Because right now we really only have our, we have a professional ethical compliance code. Um, we have, we had some, they, they dropped the supervisor, the supervisor training. I'm not, I'm, I'm sure most people have to be familiar with or aware of that by now. So the eight hour requirement um, has been lifted, but um, you still have to obviously do your supervision CEs. So I wanted to develop a product for my colleagues in the field that cataloged what supervision behaviors look like Mm -hmm. in, in the process of delivering effective supervision. And so from that, I developed four research questions. And I just want to say this, anyone who's listening who is a PhD student and hasn't developed your questions yet, don't do four questions. <laughs> do like two questions, don't do four questions. Right. Oh my gosh, Matt, I almost killed myself at the end with four questions. I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, so I developed four questions. So my first question was very straightforward. It was just more of what are people doing? How often are people reporting frequency of engaging in behavior? So it was self-reported frequencies of engaging in um, the 46 individual behaviors that I catalog. And that was just analyzed through descriptive statistics, very straightforward. Um, my second question, and this is like where I deviated from a little bit out of my, com- well, a lot, a lot out of my comfort zone. I went into the, f- the, f- the realm of statistics. Uh-oh. Dun, dun, <laughs> oh, dun. my gosh. We need to cue <laughs> yeah, some dun, like dun, foreboding dun, dun. music. Yeah, put some music on for that because like I feel like I may lose like half of the audience just in saying that word. They're like statistics. <laughs> That's right. That's right. O- only, only Derek Reed will be listening. At- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, oh, Derek's awesome. By the way, he's 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 yes, and 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 you know what? To his credit, I read an article of his just last week on like the tanning behavior of college students, and he had um, a, a experiment correlation, and I was able to read it, and I wouldn't have been able to read and understand that before my dissertation. So, I think it's pretty cool to know a little bit about statistics when you're consuming literature um, that's meant for you know like larger populations. Sure. So. Yeah, so I went into statistics, everyone, and that was a little scary for me. I was my my brain grew like way too big. I was like past my cognitive ceiling. I was like having all this emotional responses, <laughs> including almost throwing my computer out the window. But uh, basically, um, thankfully, I had some really cool people uh, who do know a lot about statistics because I am not a statistician. So anything I'm about to say, I just want to preface this with: I am not a statistician. So if I use the wrong technical word, or I'm just going to talk as though I am a behavior analyst because most behavior yep. analysts are not fluent in, in inferential statistics. Yes. Present company, um, or at least speaking for myself, <laughs> yes, for sure. 
been a long time. Uh, so my, my second question was, I wanted to look at our professional ethical compliance code categories, our PEC. So the seven sections, we have seven categories, and I wanted to know whether or not they were performed differently from each other. And so why that's important or why I believed it was important, because I could have stopped, honestly, Matt, at question one, just stopped at the descriptive statistics. Mm-hmm. Um, however, why it was important for me to push myself and, and go to the statistical component was because it gives us a way other than just visual analysis to say, yes, these are definitely different because this, that's what statistics provides us with. It gives us another way to confirm beyond just visual analysis. So for me, that was important to take the sample so that I could also make conclusions about the population. And in this case, our population are supervisors, people like you and I who are supervising field work candidates. Um, and that's that's the beauty in like going beyond just the descriptive statistics, because when you stop there, you're just looking at just that sample um, and you're limited in how much you can say about what other people may be doing beyond just the sample you collect the data on. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure because you're like my calibration check right now. I'm looking at your your nonverbals to make sure if Matt Uh-oh. Saunders that I may be losing any listener who's driving on the road in between patient A and patient B. <laughs> That's fine. Now, we, I, I, I did tell you about my lack of social skills, right? And we, we had that. No, <laughs> well, you've got a great smile right now. <laughs> All right. Um, you're doing so great. Analyze- Go right ahead. Okay. All right. So I analyze behaviors, and that's called, most people will be familiar with this term, that's called an, an ANOVA, yep. an, anal- an analysis of variance. Okay. So that's what that's called. So most people have heard of that. Um, and then my third question was I wanted to look at demographic, supervisor demographic question and employment variable variables to determine if these items were associated with higher or lower reported frequency of the individual behaviors um, and at the category level. So just to make sure everyone, I'm not losing anyone, I did an analysis of each 46 individual behaviors because ultimately I'm interested on the microscopic component. I want to know what the behavior is. The categories are nice because they help us direct future lines of research. Like if everyone is sucking in five point, excuse me, if everyone's performing poorly in 5.02, but 5.05, like off the chart, like A plus, I don't necessarily need to go run and put any fires out in that bucket, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Analyzing at a categorical level is really helpful to figure out where do I need to go put my resources right now? Um, ultimately, though, as behavior analysts, we're interested mostly in the individual items because that's what we can change. I can't change a category unless I know what the behaviors are. So question three um, d- dug into are there any any things that flagged up with uh, supervised demographics, such as years of experience, the type of degree you had, like master's, PhD, years of experience, and employment variables like where you worked, um, do you do RBT supervision, how many um, hours are you allowed to conduct field work supervise, uh, supervision, like how many hours you're allotted by your employer and such. Um, and then my fourth question, I call this my social validity question, and this is where we looked at do the um, the behave the 46 individual behaviors were there any correlations or associations between people who reported doing these behaviors at a higher rate um, did they have a um, positive impact on the person they were supervising their pass rate so we're looking at the pass rate information um, and I was only able to do that with people who supervised 100% of the hours of their fieldwork candidates. So, for example, Matt, if I was your supervisor and I did all 75 of your hours, then I would have been able to report on whether or not you passed the exam. But if I had done 50 out of your 75, I would have not reported data on you. Right. And there, for those of you who are like, well, why not? And it gets really tricky because then you're like, there's threats to the data set because then I'm like, well, what if Matt, if Zara did great for Matt for 50 hours, but then Lisa did a, an exceptional 25, who really gets credit for Matt passing the exam? Was it Lisa or Zara? So it gets really, really complicated. Yeah, that makes total um, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So we just we threw all that out and we're like, you have to have done either 50 hours for the BCABA level or um, the 75 for the full certification BCBA. So we looked at that, like where like you doing more of this behavior, did you have higher pass rates? So we looked at all 46 behaviors and that was done through the Spearman correlation, um, which is just another t- statistical test to run to look for associations between two variables. So that's kind of, that's those are my four research questions. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that last one definitely is, going to get people's attention in terms of yeah. uh, both from the student side or the, su- the trainee side as well as the supervisor yes. you know what are those things that that we can do 
better at to maximize the likelihood of, of, of passing. And we should also note that passing is not the end-all, be-all. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a starting point uh, in, in, a, in a timeline of ongoing uh, professional development, but that is definitely, you needed to get to the starting point to, to get yeah. on that timeline. So it's, it's very, yeah. very important. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think our, um, our 2000, well, the 2017 data was the pass rate went, for the first time was 65% for individuals. Um, that was the 2000, I'm sure 2018 is probably already out by now, but that was before. But that was that was our social validity question. So um, overall, I, I would just for your audience, because there's um, when you do dissertation, it's like this work of love and it's mine is 180 pages and we're not here to go over 180 pages. What I really wanted to um, share were general findings to help people understand um, what takeaway points from from what I was researching and then implications for the field. So I'll just if, if it's OK with you, I'll just kind of go through and, yeah, and take talk, it away. Yeah. talk one by one. <laughs> okay. So generally speaking, when we looked at and by the way, anyone I, I'll put this as a point of reference. Anyone who is super interested in reading my dissertation and all of it, all of its glory, it is going to be available on, on immediately in the ProQuest, uh, ProQuest, and that's where they, uh, for dissertations and theses, and then theses, sorry, and then I'm going to work on getting this published as soon as possible, although there's usually a delay by months in, in the publication process for those of you who've gone through that. So I'm going to work on getting that out, but anybody who would like a copy, I'd be happy to give you a copy as well of the, yeah. the final PDF. And, and make sure um, we get the link to that. I'll link that in the show notes for today's episode, or I could actually put the PDF in there as well. So we'll talk about that off air. Yeah, perfect. I'll get all that for your listeners. So generally, um, what I found were, and I'll talk at the categorical level because we don't have time to go over every single individual behavior, but um, generally what I found was that... um, and this maybe what should not be a surprise where the categories that performed higher were 5.05 so it's communication of written uh, of super sorry communication of supervision conditions okay um 5.04 which is designing effective supervision and training and 5.06 which is delivering feedback so those performed higher um in the descriptive statistics at the individual item level. And then when we did the statistical analysis, we, we ran the ANOVA to look for differences in the means. Those, cate- those three categories perform better than the other four categories, with 5.05 being almost perfect, which it should be almost perfect, right? Because that's the qu- types of questions we have there are, did you put your supervision contract in place before you started supervision? Do you have a termination clause? So there's very clear one-time behaviors that occur and the board has given a lot of education and training throughout um, the last several years. They provide free templates on what that contract should look like. So that we should look at that to be almost always happening, which is five. So that performed the highest. And then 5.04 which is designing effective trainings and uh, supervision. And and what I'm going to do is that one performed. um, So we're talking about uh, behavioral skills, using like behavioral skills training, modeling. um, And those were things that were formally a part of the eight hour um, supervisor training course that was required. And they're also part of, um, if you look at the 2012 supervision curriculum, although I believe they put out a new curriculum. Is that right, Matt? Have they, I I believe I heard someone say they put out a new supervision supervision curriculum and recently I think in the last few months like they updated the the one that was on the website from 2012 you know Does I have the help? website up right now and I, I can double check that and we can okay. we can we can source that out and um, okay. I can I can refer to that at the when I do the intro to this okay episode. perfect so for two, for two, I'm sorry for 5.04, there were things in there that are that were also clearly um, there was a lot of information that that's been out that's been disseminated either through the board or the, or through the required supervision CEs in regards to um, designing effective training. So we know that behavioral skills training. Um, is the core component there and then delivering feedback and and I know you actually have a section on that in your book which um 
which was really great because <laughs> not everyone does a great job at delivering feedback. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Again, all, yeah, all no. the good parts of the book are written by Lisa and let's just be clear. Uh, but, uh... No, no, you have to give yourself some credit. You have to give your, yourself some credit for sure. So those parts of the code we're doing uh, perform better. The parts of the code that performed lower um, and were statistically different were 5.01, which is uh, supervisory competence, 5.07, which is evaluating effects of supervision, and 5.02, which is supervisory volume. And um, you may be having this question right away in your head because you've been doing this for a while. Right away, you may think 5.01 supervisory competence, like people report self-reporting lower scores in that area. There was one particular question that I would call an outlier question. And for those um, for those of you just to re-familiarize with the, with the terms, that just means that there were there was a, like it just was really different from the rest of the responses. And so what happens is that brings down the average when you have outliers when you're looking at um, even in the descriptive statistics and that particular question that I that got coded really low was people responded um, participating in professional groups and um, as part of um, that question set for 5.01 overall though that that particular section people are engaging in uh, behaviors such as checking credentialing requirements before like just deciding to go practice in another area or getting additional training and supervision um, most people the median there was five and and so meaning like i'm almost always doing that we just had one outlier question in that category that really threw that down, which brought it to a lower performer category, if that makes sense yeah. to your audience. Okay. Um, Cause I don't want anyone to think that everyone's being like super shady. I just wanted to be clear, like um, that there were questions and that's why I chose to report medians and not just rely on means because I did have some outliers. Um, uh so that was kind of just question two. And then I wanted to also, I realized I didn't clarify this in the beginning. Uh, the 40, out of the 46 behaviors, 20 of the 46 were distinctly assigned to a part of the professional ethical compliance code, meaning that there was, they're directly correlated. For, so for example, 5.05 is the easiest one to use because we, we're all aware of that. But that one is having a supervision termination clause, written supervision contract, and reviewing the supervision contract before you start. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to HRIColorado.com. Again, that's HRIColorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. All right, we just had a minor technical glitch and we are back on track here hopefully uh i think we're gonna pick it up where we left it off we were on such a roll there it may or may not uh, join up perfectly but that's okay because we're gonna we're gonna continue moving on here so uh, zara uh sorry about that and uh, please continue Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I did lose a little bit track there. I apologize. Um, so we were we were just wrapping up the, talking about the uh, second question, which was in relation to um, teasing out the individual behaviors. And I think what I was saying was that 20 of the 46 were distinctly assigned to parts of the Professional Ethical Compliance Code 5.0. Um, 
26 of the 46, however, were not. And so one of the things I struggled with in relation to um, the statistics sorry, statistical analysis part is you have to, everything um, from the categorical analysis has to have a home because you're, you're analyzing the groups against each other. You're running the means against each other. And so for purposes of my analysis, I didn't want to spend like my entire research time on trying to code 26 of the recommended behaviors. So I, I'll give your audience an example because I'm sure not everyone's going to be able to run and read this, but um, Examples would be um, observing body language of the supervisee is a recommended behavior. Um, taking meeting notes is a recommended behavior, but they don't have distinct home bases in the professional ethical compliance code, if that makes sense. Yes. So, yeah. So I had um, creating group activities, continuing the professional relationships, uh, things uh, arriving on time. Matt was one of them, arriving on time. There you go. That's important. <laughs> Um, yeah, so those things are important. So be- the reason why I decided to do that was because my that would have taken the re- I would have for those who have done um, who've had to do like IOA and coding things, it gets to a whole nother thing to have everyone agree which part of the code does this most likely support. And 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 in fact that these items may not have ever intended to support. They just may may be part of an effective repertoire you have that makes you more effective. So um, anyone who's interested, you'll be able to look at that. So for purposes of a statistical analysis, I wanted to point that out. I do have a technical eighth category um, beyond the seven sections of the 5.0. So I wanted to point that out as a small technicality. And I I had to do that for the analysis, the statistical analysis. Um, So, uh, sorry, getting back on track. Um, What I wanted to look at, or general guidance or thoughts on this part was the parts of the code that are doing really well, um, we, we've had really clear guidance from from the board in our supervision curriculum. So that's 5.5, 5.4, and 5.6. And they're also a fundamental part of supervision, right, Matt? Like if you think about, um, well, after you do the, the contract, you are, you're teaching and giving feedback. Yep. That is a fundamental part of supervision. <laughs> yep. And just so, for those driving around their cars, 5.04 is designing effective supervision and training. 5.5 is communication of supervision conditions. And 5.6 is providing feedback to supervisees. Yeah. And those things all happen like in a quick encounter. Like, great, you did it. Or watch me do it. You do it. Yes, you did it. That's right. You did it. Great job. And so that that's it right there in one minute. You could have had like both of those things happen. And so that's a fundamental part of, of the supervision process. Parts of the code that were performing lower, um, they are they require more response effort. If you really tease apart the individual behaviors of uh, 5.03, 5.02, and 5.07, and I'll just give your, your listeners, because people, I mean, you're like, what does that even mean? So 5.03 is you have to confirm a skill set, um, and then you practice a skill set. So those are the two behaviors under supervisor delegation. Before you delegate, you confirm baseline, and then you practice the skill set. Okay. Um, for 5.02, I had one question there that was assigned by um, um, in regards to the literature review idea, and that's having a set supervision schedule, that meaning you have availability in your weekly schedule to be doing supervision. And then 5.07, evaluating client performance, evaluating supervisee performance, and, and um, having someone evaluate your supervision fidelity. So like, for example, Matt, you watching me, you watching me supervise someone else. Guess what, everyone? All of those things require a lot more time. Yeah. Um, so stopping to take baseline, teaching the skill, evaluation, that's a lot more time and a lot more effort. And there's not as much easy, readily available, like, here's how you do it. Here's a book on how to do it. Or here's the forms. This is what you do. There's a lot less available. So those are the parts of the code um, that require um that reform lower require more effort, ongoing um, response effort from from the supervisor, if you will. And we have less guidance on them. There's less clarity on what does this exactly mean? 5.05, everyone did really great because we've got forms we just print out and we can use as templates. So you should get that right almost always. Um, But when you look at 5.07, what does it look like, Matt, when you evaluate my behavior as my colleague? Like, what does your behavior look like? I like I don't really know. I'm just throwing that out there. The point is, is there's less clarity on how I would get that measure to get. Yeah, I always have Matt watch me or right. most of the time. Um, so that was kind of question two. Um, going into question three, I'm just going to highlight some things that kind of came up um, where I went into it with a personal bias inside my head. I was like, there's going to be like a lot of stuff for demographics, right? I like, I was like, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of stuff and I, I can't wait to report this. 
epic failure on my part. I was so wrong. The data did not actually reveal that. So what, in fact, did come for a basic demographic, and a basic demographic is going to be something like years in practice, years as a supervisor, where you practice, um, <clears throat> The type of degree you have, you hold. So the only thing that actually came up as significant and impacting how often someone reported their um, engaging in the behaviors that support the compliance was years as a supervisor. Um, so people, here we go, two years and less self-reported lower frequencies of engaging in behaviors that support compliance with 5.01. Um, so I want to say, because I may have people who are super procedural and be like, but wait a minute, Zara, what if I've never had an opportunity to practice outside of my scope? That's not a problem. I had a, I had a way to default out where you can say this is not applicable to me, so that not would not have counted against you. So people on their own self-reported, um, when they answered that question, even though uh, not a NA was available, they self-reported lower um, lower frequency of checking uh, behaviors that support 5.01 compliance, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. people with two years or less. Um, so that was one big nugget that I wanted to point out. Um, but other than that, really, um, most of the things that flagged up were what I would consider employment-related variables. And so if we remember um, the LeBlanc and Lucielli article, which I hope I said his last name right, by the way, um, the 2016 article, and you do have it as a reference in your um, field work remote field workbook. It's, uh, I think, intro Introduction to Refining Supervision Practices. I, you probably know which article I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah. So, in the very end, um, the last page, they specifically said, we need to know more about work exigencies that may be barriers to individual supervising. And so, I always remembered that part of of that article because my methodologist, um, Dr. Tony Plotner, he was awesome, by the way. He helped me survive these questions. He was like saying, you really, you should really consider just consolidating and not including all these variables, these employment variables, because it's because I had to run 112 ANOVAs, which for anyone who does statistical analysis, that is a, a lot. Um, that is a right. lot. So he's looking out for you, trying to like say, we got to yes. get you done. And, yes. uh, yeah. He's like, you're, he's like, do you know how many tables, ANOVA tables you're going to have to do? Do you know how many, do you know how many paragraphs? <laughs> and oh my gosh, Dr. Plotner was right. <laughs> but but here's the, here's the thing. I fought for them, Matt, because I that resonated. That article that Linda LeBlanc and Lucille wrote resonated with me. And I was like, someone needs to find out. And by the way, I took the time to ask the question of my respondents. I should do something with the information. I shouldn't just let it sit there. Oh so yeah, I that's thought, a good. That's always a good principle to to actually you know look at the data that you ask people to. Yeah. Provide, right? I'm like, why did I even ask you? <laughs> so I fought to keep them in, um, and, and we kept them in. So they're in the ProQuest. And now whether whether they make the cut for publication, I hope that they will because they were significant. But let me give your listeners um, and you like some just a, some summary of what I did find. Um, so it turns out that, in fact, employment variables are more um, predictive from my sample, from my preliminary study for this particular group, were more predictive of how often someone was going to be engaging in behaviors, um, self-reporting versus the basic demographic. So that's number one. Um, the things that came up the most, and this is not going to be shocking to anyone, but it's nice to confirm it, were the number of hours allotted. So that means your employer protects time in your schedule to do supervision of fieldwork candidates and the number of hours that you actually scheduled. So meaning what you, so Matt, if I give you 20 hours, but then you um, you use 25, that's the number you scheduled. So the terminology difference is allotted, is given to you by an employer and scheduled is what you actually had to use. Mm -hmm. So those two time components were very um, important indicators of how often someone would be able to engage in behaviors. And that's not a shock at all. You have to have time to engage in supervi supervision. Um, and the other thing was place of employment, uh, individuals who worked in, in university settings um, d perform self-reported higher scores in, in all the categories. And, and that's a follow-up question as to why, like what barriers they may not have that for someone in a home-based, school-based, I, I know you work and do school consultation or clinic-based, et cetera, may not have. They may not have certain barriers, but that would be a follow-up question to find out. Um, though, like speaking just in, like from my own experience, it's probably because they're not dealing with consumers. Um, they don't have they don't have as many <laughs> things happening in their day that are distractors from sure. 
supervision, <laughs> uh, but we would need to do research. Um, so here, here were some things like little nuggets that I thought were interesting in relation to just allotted hours. So of my sample, Matt, 25, about 25% of people are not given any time in their work week to conduct activities related to supervision, zero hours, but they're they're having to do supervision. So immediately, anyone who's driving, if you're one of these people, you're, you may like have like, oh my God, that's me, or yeah, I'm not really given time, but I'm expected to do this, this thing. Supervision takes a lot of effort. The things that happen before, during, and after, kind of like a patient contact in the medical field. They have to prep your chart, deliver the care, and they have to do things afterwards. And so you have to have time to do all of those things, and it is a lot of time. Um, so some people were given zero hours, and I thought that that was amazing immediately scary when I when I read that. But, sure, um, I'm sure that happens all the time. I'm sure there, like you said, there are people driving around listening to this, you know, again, identifying with that. And uh, yeah, it sounds like under those circumstances, it might, yeah, it might be something along the lines of, yeah, you know, th- these are your clinical hours and supervised right. when you when you get to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which that's that's a that's a you know to, to quote to quote Doctor Britton that's a competing yeah. contingency if there ever yeah. ever was one right yeah. and when do I get to sleep right <laughs> um, most people reported most people reported needing one to five hours and so I would uh, and I'll talk about this and implications in just a minute and most people reported supervising one to three candidates so if this sounds like you that's a little bit better um, individuals uh, self reported higher across all forty six behaviors when they had access to more than one fieldwork candidate. And that's not a surprise because you need more than one to have a group, right? (laughs) So anything related to group, it requires more than one person. Um, uh, Some other things were that I thought were interesting from my my sample um, were that most people are serving consumers and supervising RBTs. And and we're talking handling caseloads or 12 or more. Um, So if you think about everything I've just gone over with, let's just, let me summarize what I just said from my research. So it'll connect all these dots because it's a lot of information. If my sample is primarily serving 12 or more consumers, supervising RBTs, and may or may not have hours in their week to supervise, but are maybe supervising one to three candidates, um, if you're if you're that person, if that fits you, that's alarming for you. Like if if you're driving and you're like, oh my gosh, I I do like I do serve all these clients. I'm not given any hours, and I do supervise one to three candidates. I feel anxious for you right now. <laughs> like I really am like my heart's beating for you. That must, you must be really stressed out right now. Um, so that's a problem that uh, we can talk about that in a little bit, but um, I, I think it's a problem. I, I'm going to go on record and say, I think that's a problem for, for, for that particular role as a supervisor for fieldwork candidates. I think that that's a little bit of an issue. So that's kind of what my, that, that area fleshed out. And then um, I'll get to my fourth question. I'll summarize this and we'll jump into implications. Matt was the correlation test the one that you said people may be interested in the most. So, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, and I was too because I was like, "Am I a good supervisor?" <laughs> so, out of the seven, out of the forty-six, seven, seven of the forty-six came up with correlations, and so I'll I'll just really quickly run a Spearman correlation is just um, what it's testing for is an association, how strong of an association there is between two variables, and it's denoted by um, rho, which Derek Reed knows probably all about that. Um, so if you look at my my visual um, graph, you'll you'll see those you'll see that visual available. But um, here are the things that came up. I'll just read the, I'll read them through for you um, and for your listeners. We're checking credentialing requirements, which supports 5.01. And remember what I said about. Um, individuals who have been practicing as a supervisor for less than two years, they self-reported lower in this area. So I'll, I'll connect some dots in just a second. But the more you um, engage or self-reported higher checking credentialing requirements, then the pass rate of your supervisees was higher. So I'll just do like a quick interpretation. Um, seeking additional training and supervision for a new area of practice, again, that's 5.01. The more you engage in that behavior, the higher your um, pass rate. Ethics. So taking ethics, um, and I had that coded in a miscellaneous category, and I'll explain that, um, or it's explained in my in my um, discussion as to why. Attending conferences, miscellaneous. Reviewing literature, that's also coded as miscellaneous. Practicant, practicing a skill set, 5.03. And remember again for your listeners that that was one of the like that's how I interpreted it. The number one ethics alleged violation was in, within this was in this area of the code that um, the white paper was on. It was delegating um, to your super inappropriate delegations. Um, so the more that you practice a skill set, the higher 
um, your pass rate was. Um, and then the last one is evaluating client performance. This was the only one of the seven that had a negative correlation. So what this means, Matt, for, I'll use you um, as an example. The more time you spend evaluating Johnny, Susie, clients, your students, um, and your school caseload, the less, the worse I am as your super, your supervisee, the, the less likely I am to pass the exam. That, so that's what a negative mm. correlation is. It goes, it's inverse. It doesn't have a positive correlation. It's sure. like the reverse. Um, and, and if you think about that, questions I had is, does that mean like individuals have higher caseloads? So they reported they were doing um, the behavior almost always, but is that because that's an inherent part of their their job description where they're seeing consumers? Those were just follow-up questions I had that I haven't investigated. Um, but those are the seven parts of um, the seven correlations that came back, one being um, a negative correlation, the last one. So the more you evaluate client performance, um, the lower the pass rate was that you self-reported. Interesting. Yeah. So that kind of uh, summarizes the the nitty gritty of each of the research questions, and I I'll go into just like takeaway points really quick for your audience, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do appreciate kind of going through into the weeds with that stuff. It's very it, it's fascinating, and it's it's definitely. Um, I, I guess the one I guess reflection I have just not with any specific element of your dissertation work, but just more generally is just that there is such a need for more of this type of investigation and perhaps we can talk about some future research questions that we could look at but i i just want to pause for a minute and just uh commend you on on doing this work you know there's oh. such a, a a dearth of literature and in, in, in terms of identifying what we specifically do and what we need to um what, what are we doing well what do we need to get better at and things like that so um, but yeah, go, go right. Ahead. Yeah. So what are the, the kind of big picture takeaways, if you will, that, that yeah. folks uh, in the audience can uh, take from, from, from this yeoman's task that you, uh, <laughs> that you finished? Yeah. So thank you for saying that. I want to make sure everyone understands that. And my Dr. Drosgay was like, make sure like people understand this, this is just one study and this was hypothesis generating. Um, this was not hypothesis testing. So like, like you said, like there's no information. And so I was like going out to this pioneer, like I'm searching for anything I can find in order to help improve the practices or figure out what is going on. So we would want to ideally replicate the study get, or, you know, do another sample and then run the same test to see. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Cause I think that's an important side note that I don't want anyone to freak out and be like, Dr. Zara Hadjiagamassini thinks said this, and no, in fact, this was just one study. <laughs> this is a preliminary study, and it's just one attempt to get some information. So please, um, please just kind of keep that in context. But these are my takeaway points that I highlighted um, from uh, from doing this research. Were employment number one? Employment variables are important. So doc, Dr. LeBlanc and Lucielli were right in their 2016 article. They're like. They needed someone to look at work exigencies. I've tried to take a stab at it the best way I could. And what I found, in fact, that people need time from their employers, protected time. I'm not talking about just get it done when you get it done. It's like every Friday or Tuesday or whatever, like whatever, protected office time. Let's just call it that um, to handle your your candidates. And um, the more candidates you'll have, you're going to need more allotted time. So as I mentioned in my demographic and employment variables, people said that to handle one to three client or candidates or certification, pre-certification folks, they need about one to five hours a week. So if you're handling more than three or four and up, you're going to need more hours. I just want to be clear, like that number should go up if you have more than that um, at your place of employment. Um, we do need follow-up research. So I know we, you just kind of talked about that. I'm interested in Matt particularly in investigating 5.02 supervisory volume. So we need follow-up research to really get into the nitty gritty of, so if I'm, if so, so for example, if I'm saying, Matt, these are the 46 behaviors that um, the individual behaviors, regardless of what category they go into, um, that are part of effective, high quality and ethical supervision. I need to figure out how much time it takes to engage in these behaviors. And we kind of already have something which I think is neat. And in the um, treatment of ASD, they have the publication available online where it talks about how much time it takes to case manage, where they had subject matter experts come together and really kind of figure that out, which was really helpful when we were trying to deal with healthcare funders who were constantly saying, oh, you don't need to supervise that case. You only need one hour a month. You'll be fine. Right. But, but Ali, you really need lots of hours a month to 
appropriately supervise a consumer's case. And in this situation, my analogy is that um, if you were my supervisee, you were essentially like my consumer. I'm responsible for you. You are consuming my supervision services. And so in that, that relationship is, is similar. And so we need more information on, on how much time it takes to effectively deliver supervision for fieldwork candidates. And so that 5.02 is... Um, where I'm interested in looking at next. Um, employers, anyone who's an employer, <laughs> or if you're a BCBA who is in an administrative setting, please like, like, you know, drive this home to your employer. But employers need to know the PECC and understand the responsibility that their employees have to adhere to 5.0, 5.0, um, the, the, the responsibilities. And so if you're um, signing individuals like, like 20 consumers and then want them to do fieldwork um, supervision, that does not make sense at all. <laughs> that, in fact, may be putting your employee into an ethical dilemma. Yeah, um, no question. They, <laughs> they don't have volume. Um, and, and I don't know, Matt, if you look at the part of the code this way, but I think that there's almost like a sequential relationship, right? So 5.01, you have to be competent. Two, you have to have the volume. Then you assess, you design the training. Um, the communication condition of the conditions, I, I don't know, that should probably be in the front, but it doesn't matter. You deliver feedback and then you evaluate. It's kind of like a sequential relationship. Yeah, yeah that, I totally see that, yeah. Yeah, so in my mind, I want to stop pe people at 5.02 if I can and say before, like really self-evaluate or have your employer self-evaluate, do I even have the time? Um, so that was important. Um, Employers should avoid assigning fieldwork supervision to a newly certified BCBA who's got less than two years post-certification experience. So I'm already, I'm just encouraging people. The board is already coming out with a requirement in January 1st, 2022, which is going to impose restrictions the within the first year of post-certification, where you're going to have to, um, you're not going to be able to supervise unless you've got someone in, in exceptional conditions um, that you may need to do the supervision, that you have to be tagged to someone who's been doing it for five years or longer. I'm going to go ahead from my research and say, maybe not have anyone who's just post-certification do fieldwork supervision in general. Uh, it's probably a good idea to let them just do direct skill stuff and figure that out <laughs> before they're teaching other people. Matt, I can tell you, <laughs> you have a comment. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it makes perfect sense. You know, I, and of course there's going to be an, uh, an outlier here or there, like someone who's been practicing without certification yeah. for, for years and years and years. Uh, yes. and, and, uh, and, and things like that, but that that recommendation should be broadly applicable to yes the large majority of people going through this process, and that, yeah. I think that's kind of the, the design standard we need to aim for. Yeah, and thank you for saying that. I I, I did want to say there are people who are exceptional who've been who have like maybe like a psychologist who just had, didn't sit for the exam, but has had a, like a licensed psychologist who's had all of the training and been been able to ethically practice appropriately, but they just went and got the, sure. the certification. So that sure. you are correct. Yeah, right. are yeah. or a BCABA who's been doing lots of awesome work and, and um, yeah. has taken the, the coursework to fulfill the obligations for the for the full right. certification yeah. exam. Yes. So thank, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So that's in the employer side. Um, you need to have access to more than one candidate. And it gets into this dilemma of if I'm working with all these consumers, how do I have time to deal with like several candidates to do group. Um, and I do, but, but, but we know from the, Val so Valentino et al, 2016, and it's in that, it's, it's in that same, just tell your, just tell your listeners to get the entire article, behavior analyst and practice, the yep. whole supervision section. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have, really, I'll have all the links in the show notes, but yeah, really that's, just, yeah, just read the whole thing. Cause it just, that's it just right. tears it all apart. Um, she talks about, or I'm sorry, they talk about the collateral learning, um, interpersonal skills. And I know Matt, you guys are, you talked about in your book and you're interested in that, but there are huge benefits. And I've heard some of your speakers, I think like, uh, Pat Fryman talk about the soft skills, like the ability to communicate with other people it is key to being an effective behavior analyst. <laughs> Um, so it's important that people have uh, the opportunity to practice those skills in field work. Um, I did uh, offer some solutions. So if those of you are driving like, Zara, I only have time to do one candidate. I'm already like slammed. Um, I know in, in my neck of the woods, we have a nice um, collegial group where we work together and we share information and resources. And I do think there are some creative solutions. So I don't want anyone to think like, okay, she's saying this, but then what are solutions to these barriers? Because I really don't have time. Um, and someone else controls my schedule and I'm overwhelmed already. And I 
want to just help this really nice person get through their field work. But really, a well-rounded field work experience should probably include group supervision. Um, that's that's my personal opinion um, in, in doing field work for the last um, 10 years. Like that's what I believe is is a is good if you're able to do it, and it's good for the the supervisee. Um, I don't know if you have any personal thoughts on that, Matt, if you've had the opportunity to do group supervisions uh, formats. Uh, n- no. no. Uh, okay. m- most m- the, the lion's share of supervisor work I've done as individual. I've been... Got you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know, I, I, I know Lisa does a ton of group supervision yeah. and, and uh, is, has a lot of experience in that, that, that yeah. area. Yeah, I think group supervision is just really great. Um, there, but anyways, there are solutions, and I do talk about them in my literature review, but you can collaborate with other people in your area. Um, and, and and myself, even as our, our current president for our state chapter, um, I'm, if someone emailed me and was like, hey, I need help getting races or getting people together or like building some relationships so people can network, I think it's possible that people, you can go through other avenues too. So don't feel like you don't have any options. I think there are creative solutions that, you know, because ultimately, we want to help each other um, engage in these behaviors that are helpful to our field. So please don't be um, discouraged if you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, And then lastly, for the board, um, I would like to see more explicit guidance on parts of the code 5.01, 5.02, 5.03, and 5.07. Specifically, Matt, um, how often the behavior should be occurring. So like participating in a professional group, should I be doing that yearly uh, or should what does that mean like I want like I want for me like I want frequency <laughs> like frequency like in a year and then evaluating I talked about um, 5.03 and uh, this is maybe a question if you want to jump in and answer how, how would you um, do baseline for your supervisee if I was your supervisee what would your behavior look like if I'm starting off with you uh, yeah that's that's a great question one of the things that um, y- I've done before is just, uh, you know, and again, it's, it, it's challenged with all, all the difficulties of, of self-report, but, uh, you know, I've used kind of checklists and things like that to just get an idea of where they, that, that survey different areas of the task list. Right. Um, and that's, uh, that's something I got from, uh, again, it's a, that's a, that's a, something I got from Megan Miller. So, um, uh, you know, so that would be one starting point, certainly, if, especially in a remote supervision context where you're not, you know, uh, observing someone in, in the moment working right. with, with the client that makes it difficult to kind of collect actual data on. Yeah, exactly. And and so my process may be a little different than yours, right? Like I may be using a different tool or a different like Likert scale. And so the point is, is that you and I may be doing it differently, right? Uh, mm-hmm. like, or there, it could be why it could be vastly differently. I would like to see more guidance in that area, especially since that was listed as a the number one alleged violation. I think we need like, what does it mean to assess baseline, um, collect baseline before you start um, delegating stuff? Um, 5.07 evaluation. I, I don't know that people... Um, that, that one in and of itself, it's like, oh, great. It's like at the tail end and it's like, it's a lot of effort, but it would be nice to get an idea of, um, what that could look like. And I will say for myself, for anyone who's interested, I, you can have a copy of my actual survey and I've encouraged people. I had several of my content and expert reviewers who emailed me back very positive and like, oh, I didn't even realize some of these things were part of, you know, effective supervision recommendations. And so it was generated on a Likert scale of based on how often you occur, per, you engage in behavior per an opportunity from one to five, five being almost always or 81 to 80, hundred percent of opportunities and one being zero to 20 (laughs) percent almost never you can use that to self self assess and establish your own baseline privately if you want to look at your own um, supervision behavior so the tool itself the survey itself can be its own assessment baseline and you can have you can make it um an evaluative process if you want and built into your own supervision behavior um just as an fyi for anyone who's interested because i myself when i was researching it i was all these behaviors i was like i don't do that i don't do (laughs) Um, There were things that I just didn't do because I also just didn't know because we don't have a lot of literature. A lot of people, I wondered, um, and I wrote about this in my my write-up, I I wondered, I should have had a question that just said, I wasn't aware of this behavior, that this was a recommended behavior, Um, because that would have been like several of the questions for me. Sure, Um, sure. 
So that's kind of in general, um, uh, you know, overall. Um, I, oh, I, I did have this one little point, and I hope this doesn't make anybody uh, mad, but I do want to say it because I, I do so desperately love our field and want, want it to continue to grow it in a responsible way because we've seen an explosion in the last five to six years. Um, the growth rate is, 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 is like exciting, but it's also scary. It's, it's both of those things at the same time. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought about, Matt, was also um, maybe requiring people. So a lot of my people who reported, where do they get their supervision? How do they develop their own supervision curriculums? A lot of people got, got it through online resources or attending conferences. That's how they got their supervision skills from initially. And so if we look at that, we have a generation of behavior analysts teaching the next generation um, behavior analysts based on maybe practices we would consider may not be the most effective or appropriate teaching methods for this type of like position. So I would maybe suggest putting that this out there is in the future, would it be possible to consider consider a graduate uh, course that specifically you should take if you want to be designated as a supervisor for fieldwork candidates, but it wouldn't be part of the actual approved coursework sequence and wouldn't stop you from getting your BCBA. It would be an addendum course you'd need to take. Um, uh, and there's a couple different re reasons why, but um, you'll understand this. I really, You really need to have compet competency-based assessments involved in something like this where we're, we're essentially protecting the integrity of the field, right? Um, yeah. By, by having some of these, I'll call them quality assurance measures in place. Um, so just online training, I guess what I'm saying, may not be the best method for this particular role, um, or it may need to be uh, supplemented with something else. Yeah, that that's a good way to put that, yeah. 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 I think that, um, you know, again, we've uh, mentioned some of Jim Carr's appearances on the show, yeah. and I think one of the things he talked about is... Uh, you know, the, the, the role of the clinical director and what skill set should that clinical director have, you know, and, and that seems to be something that would fall under that purview. So right. um, I know we're, uh, I, we've exceeded the amount of time you've promised me here. So uh, <laughs> I, and I really appreciate you being so generous with taking a huge chunk out of your morning. Um, so are there, um, and you've already given a, a, a ton of advice to BCBAs, <laughs> newly minted or, or, or otherwise, uh, or, or non newly minted. I'm, I'm learning a lot in this conversation. Uh, and I, I'm, uh, I don't know what the the the, the term the, the, the term for only minted. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, before we wrap up here, is there is there anything else you want to leave us with for uh, because this just again this has just been a uh, a huge a huge resource here and again just to remind people i've got a i've got a huge list of things here that i'm going to track down for the show notes for this episode so uh, we can have some resources there as well yeah. but uh, anything else you want to leave us with would be great yeah um so i this i'm like i i um wanted to like have very like specific things for your listener audience versus things that were more abstract because i wanted like i'm like really um focused on things that i'm like okay i understand what that means number one um if you're newly certified or recently certified and you're looking for a job um, please ask your employer if you're going to be expected to supervise fieldwork candidates so go ahead and ask that question in the interview process and then your follow-up question should be how many hours will you be allotted in your schedule to engage in all the things required of you for field work um, supervision. So that would be an interview question. That would be one thing. Um, my second point was I wanted to say is if you're newly certified, and I think I heard your speaker, and I don't want to mispronounce his name, your, the podcast you put out on Monday, Dr. Is it Luis? I'm, I'm going to mispronounce his name, the Night. one on. Uh, yeah, thank you. The end of his show, um, his, his uh, advice is kind of similar to what I would say where he talked about just just because you passed your exam, it's like, great. That's yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of conceptualized it a little bit differently. But what I say is, if you're newly certified, please continue to have a relationship with someone who's been practicing for five years or more. And you should do routine, routine monthly or bi-monthly check-ins so that you have someone you can go to for ethical dilemmas, which are the number one um, challenge new practitioners face with how do I handle these uncomfortable situations. Um, so you need to check in with someone. And it could be built in into your employment situation where you have like staff meetings, clinical meetings, but 
even so, if you're not really comfortable, you need to be comfortable because there may be contingencies in a workplace setting where you are nervous to be honest about your ethical dilemma. You need to have someone, I call it your circle of trust people, the people that can know all the, all the business and they're not going to report you to the board. They're, right. Because what you're doing is you're doing what you should do. What the board wants you to do is confer with someone. Yes. That's what you're, so, you're supposed to do. That's the number one thing. So make sure you pick someone you can confer with that you can be honest with whatever it is you're experiencing. Um, because once you've passed that exam, that is acquisition only. And I think um, he was what he was really describing was the idea of the, the whole stages of learning are like acquisition, fluency, generalization, and maintenance. And to become fluent and be generalized, you have to still have feedback from people who've been doing it longer and effectively longer than you. Um, and then my last one, which I've heard you say this, and I'm going to shout it out again, please join your state chapter and go to your state conference. You like just do it. It's like a good thing to do. And it supports compliance with 5.01 being part of a professional group. So be, please be part of your, your, um, your state chapter participate. And, and sometimes if cost is an issue, you certainly could email their leadership. They may have some rates or some options they can offer you. I know for us, we, we would always consider that at SCA, yeah, but there or was volunteering. Some, Volunteering, exact volunteering to get into the conference for free. Yep, so you can still participate. That, thank you, Matt. That's a really great um, example. We will always take volunteers, yep. <laughs> and you can get to the conference, get your conference fees waived that way. It's a great way to network and stay connected. And so those are things that, um, those are kind of the three pieces that I I really think are important. And, and on that, I wanted to segue because. Our, um, our state conference is coming up. This is a plug for SCA. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but but, but I, I hear you all the time talk about this. Matt, guess what we have in November in South Carolina, Charleston, that you don't have? <laughs> uh, nice weather? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have fall weather, so we would love to host any, you, you, any of your listeners come to Charleston, South Carolina, always on the top 10 travel places, um, cities, number number two place to get married. So if you want to get married while you're here, you can also get married. I think my um, wife please. might have a problem with that. <laughs> well, come and enjoy the weather. Your wife will probably like the fact that it will be like 70 or 68 degrees. Yes. Um, no snow. We have great weather and great food. So please come see us. We've got Pat Fryman, Pat McGreevy. We've got a great supervision workshop, Nicole Gravina, um, some local uh, Katie Wolf and uh, Shannon Biagi. So we would love to have you come join us in our beautiful city in Charleston this November. So we have great weather. So please come see us. All right. Send me the link to that, too. I'll make sure that gets in today's episode. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Matt. This has truly been an honor. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, this has been extraordinarily helpful, and I know the <laughs> listeners will, will get a lot out of this. Yeah, thank you. All right. I appreciate all the work you're doing. All right. Thanks so much for joining me today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast.